Okay, good morning and afternoon and a warm welcome to this high level political forum side event, Building Back Better, Forest Pathways for Green Recovery, Advancing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Today's event is jointly organized by the International Tropical Timber Organization and the Food and the Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, and is presented by the Collaborative Partnership of Forests. My name is Veronika Juch, and I'm working on Global Forest Pathways in FAO's Forestry Division, and I'll be moderating today's session. Forest and sustainable forestry can help the world recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and combat looming environmental crises such as climate change and biodiversity loss. However, this requires societies to better recognize the considerable value of forests and trees and their crucial roles in building inclusive, resilient and sustainable economies. The State of the World's Forest 2022 provides three pathways to implement this new perspective of making development work with the environment, protect measures for halting deforestation, restore, making land more productive and use, investing in building economically viably green value chains that provide for resilient livelihoods. These forest pathways have the potential to provide decentralized solutions that are highly cost effective and that can be implemented comparatively rapidly and at scale. Today's event will look into how locally adapted solutions, innovations and investments in young talent and innovative ideas on these forest pathways can be integrated into efforts to build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic and to lead to a whole of society mobilization as envisaged by the Agenda for Sustainable Development. We will be starting the meeting with the opening remarks from the Deputy Director of FIU's Forestry Division, Eva Drummetsteiner, who has also led the work on the State of the World's Forest 2022 that I've already mentioned. Eva, the floor is yours for some short opening remarks. Thank you very much, Veronica. And, uh... Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, everybody. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here today at this occasion of the High Level Political Forum uh, from New York. And I'm stepping in for the, the lead organizer of this event, the International Tropical Timber Organization. We have had some connection issues, obviously, so you hear me speaking twice today to you as uh, welcoming you here today and the panelists to listen to uh, how we move forward on the SDG 15. The SDG 15 focuses on protection, restoration, and enhancing the sustainable use. The first few words of the SDG 15 have a lot of potential to not only move us forward on the SDG 15, but on a range of other things and SDGs that we need to get uh, to move forward at the same time, especially in a situation of of looming and increasing crisis as we are still working through the economic uh, fallout of a, uh, of a pandemic and the crisis of in, in, in additional uh, conflicts that we currently have that also have direct implications on livelihoods and on the environment. So what we are here today is to listen to panelists from different backgrounds, international organizations, governments, the youth and the private sector to, to look at solutions to illustrate the potential of trees and forests to contribute to a green recovery and to building a better future for us all, while at the same time being cognizant of the many issues that we have, uh, including climate change and including biodiversity loss. Finding solutions in this context will need all our energy in terms of finding innovations that work for people on the ground in different contexts and solutions. And we need to do it together. So here today we are to learn uh, from examples, learn from experiences from our panelists. And then I hope we also will learn from you as, uh, as, as people who have 
valuable experiences to share with us, maybe ask some questions, and then we hope with this side event, we contribute to the discussion at the HLPF uh, here in New York. With this, uh, I hope, I wish us all a very successful meeting today. Back to you, Veronica. Thank you very much, Ewald, for these welcoming remarks uh, from the side of FAO. And I'm very happy because I see that Shamsat Kuo was able to join us now. And I would in introduce her now without any further delay. Um, Shamsat Kuo, as many from you know, is the executive director of the International Tropical Timber Organization. Before taking office in February this year, she served as the ITTO's Director for Operations since 2017, and she brings with her many years of experience in international law, trade negotiations, international collaboration, sustainable development in tropical forestry, and with the, uh, with the private sector. It's my pleasure to give her the floor now for the welcoming remarks. Sham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Veronica, and my humblest and sincere apologies to everyone for being slightly late. These uh, technical issues always hit you at the most unexpected times. But thank you also for the privilege of speaking and being with all of you today, uh, focusing on our aim to contribute to the high level political forum discussion surrounding the key area that you know, controls our lives really for all of us who are in the field here, forestry. In addition to what Mr. Remat Steiner has just mentioned in his welcoming remarks, I will keep mine short. As we all know, forestry, especially tropical forestry that benefits people and nature are extremely important and critical for the sustainable development that can help the world recover at this point from COVID-19 and also combat, combat the multiple global environmental crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. Mr. Remesteiner also mentioned all the other disruptions that we are currently facing. And from our perspective, this will definitely have an impact on communities, the environment, and particularly forestry in pretty much the near to mid term future. When we look at the discussions on policy and technical sessions, that we have experienced from the World Forestry Congress and other international fora that are continuing at this point, particularly the conventions on biolog biological diversity and also the upcoming COP27. It is undeniable that climate change, conflict and food security requires the active presence of forests, particularly sustainably managed forests, which conserve soil and water, filter the air, prevent land degradation and desertification, reducing the risk of floods, landslides, droughts, and other disasters, and provide forestry stakeholders, including local communities and indigenous communities with much needed income and materials while providing food security. Of course, in doing all this, we must recognize that in forwarding the interests of bioeconomy and nature-based solutions, which is part of the conversation that we are about to hear from the panelists today on green pathways. We need to increase the traction. We need to increase the traction through nature-based solutions and the bioeconomy as a means for building greener, healthier, and more resilient societies. And one of the most concrete and living examples from this is the implementation of sustainable forestry. It is the most environmentally friendly producing materials for further construction, which then contribute to the collaborative partnership on forests joint initiatives, which also includes green incentives and green pathways. And let's not forget the sustainable wood for sustainable world joint initiative. We have another joint initiative on restoring forest landscapes. And finally, there is another one on education that most of us are actively involved in. On that note, we need coherent approaches for scaling up and replicating successful projects that all our organizations have conducted. And in this way, we don't reinvent the wheel, but we continue investing in sustainable and successful ways forward in order to achieve our successful 
green pathways. On that note, I wish all of you a very productive and constructive session today. And we now take you back to the moderator, Veronica, to introduce our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for setting the scene so eloquently and highlighting again the challenges that we are all facing and how this is going to impact forestry as well. And I think we take particularly note of how you highlighted that we need to increase traction um, through the solutions we have at hand. And this is now really my pleasure to move to the panel that will look into these locally adapted solutions that we have. And one of the questions would be how indeed we can scale them up and how can we be coherent um, moving forward with these examples that we already have. Um, also a note to our audience um, after the panel, and I will introduce the panelists um, in a minute. Uh, you will have the possibility to ask questions. You can already put them forward now in the dedicated Q&A box. Um, with this, let me move to our first panelists. And in the first question, we're going to look into how we can reconcile for food and nutrition security with the protection of forests in a changing climate. Serena Fortuna is the Red Plus team leader and co-leads the forest and climate work stream in the forestry division of FAO. She brings with her an extensive experience in climate change mitigation and adaptation, reducing deforestation forest and forest degradation and disaster risk reduction that was already mentioned now in the opening remarks. And in her work, she particularly focused on enhancing governance, working on integrated landscape approaches and to explore the synergies with agriculture. And my question actually builds very much on this, um, Serena. Halting deforestation is potentially one of the most cost effective actions for mitigating climate change if efforts ramp up. Although the rate of deforestation is declining, still 10 million hectares per year were lost between 2015 and 2020. And recent data highlights the role of agriculture in the loss of forests. Um, Serena, can you share with us some of your thoughts how we can better reconcile achieving food and nutrition security while protecting at the, chain, the, at the same time our forests and this in a, in a, in a time of a changing climate? Serena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Veronica, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants and the distinguished uh, speakers. Indeed, probably to start with, uh, it's important to remember a bit, as uh, Misham also indicated, that the forest and agriculture are really intertwined. Uh, forest plays very key role and services for agriculture sustainability and production, ranging from the habitat for pollinators to the water regulation and climate regulation. Both of them, agriculture and forestry, play a key role in maintaining rural uh, economy and uh, sustainable, sustainable livelihoods uh, of indigenous people, of local communities. They do face also common challenges. Indeed, despite all the efforts, uh, we, the world, is still facing an enormous issue with hunger and malnutrition. Current dates are giving us the indication that one tenth of the global population, 811 million people, are still malnourished. Climate change, of course, exacerbates these uh, this impacts and affect agri food systems. And taking it from the bright side of the story here, forests, indeed, as Moto Mishamp indicated, can play a central role in uh, combating um, and achieving uh, climate change and achieving the, uh, the NDCs, the national determined com contributions. So it's important that these two sectors, agriculture and forestry, are seen together as allies. And we need to shift that discourse of seeing agriculture versus, uh, versus forestry, but seeing them at the same time as uh, uh, collaborators and alliance. Uh, indeed, as you mentioned also, we do see uh, that agri agriculture still drives important uh, percentage more than 90% of uh, deforestation is driven by agriculture, but yet we are at a very important junction uh, here. There is an increasingly important call for actions, uh, for uh, acceleration of, uh, of the actions on the ground to really identify the synergies and uh, joint efforts from the turning the tide of deforestation, the Food System Summit, the Glasgow Leader Declaration, and the FAC Dialogue, the, the Forest uh, Agriculture and Commodity Trades. I could go on, but indeed, uh, let's focus more on what is really needed in, turn of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, addressing this such a, such a complex uh, challenge. And indeed, to addressing this a complex challenge, 
solutions are also very uh, um, uh, cross-sectoral, multi-stakeholder and uh, concerted actions are needed. We need to have government, private sector, communities, women, indigenous people playing each of them a specific role in this, uh, in this regards. We do need long-term commitments, finance, technology and scale up innovation. Through identifying a bit what were the past success stories and what are the current uh, circumstances, we identified at least six main action areas that can identify and be put in practice. Uh, of course, starting from uh, integrated land use planning and management of forests and, uh, and agriculture, with a fully kind of fully recognizing the rights of stakeholders uh, and also including the critical role on restoration of degraded lands for sustainable production uh, of, uh, of commodities. As a second important point, we also identified increased political and financial uh, investments, uh, sort of uh, coherence. Um, there needs to be an important uh, coherence between the agriculture and forest sector, including uh, trying to identify the, those, those investments that move away the incentives uh, the, the, um, the, the incentives from uh, uh, actions that can uh, be detrimental to forests, but on the other side can actually be uh, more kind of uh, moving into the production of commodities that do not impact uh, forests. Also promotion of, for example, repurpo rep uh, repurposed agricultural subsidies and green impact and, and green, uh, and green uh, circular economy will be very relevant. Within this uh, landscape also it's very important to scale up finance uh, both from public and private sector. From the public point of view, for example, from national and international, and the climate finance, uh, the climate finance linked, for example, to REP plus results-based payments can also play a very important role in this, uh, in this regard. As a third area, technology and innovation needs to be scaled up, enhanced agricultural production needs to be identified, for example, ranging from conservation agriculture, uh, improved livestock management, superior adapted plant and animal, um, and animal uh, genetic resources. As a fourth area, also the promotion of responsible agriculture supply chains. Uh, increasingly more number of countries are calling for removals of deforestation for agriculture commodities, especially beef, soy, soy, palm oil, cocoa, coffee, rubber and timber. And there are emerging markets that are really moving into that uh, direction. I'll take just one more uh, minutes, Veronica, to indicate two, two more areas and a couple of examples. Uh, the ensuring of the enabling environment is critical uh, from the government's perspective, but also from an engagement of local communities and uh, also creating that enable environment to boost the private sector engagement. And lastly, the, as a sixth area of intervention, the rethinking of food systems. At the Food System Summit uh, last September, seven coalitions uh, out of the 30 were moving into the direction of uh, removing conversion from uh, uh, food systems. 27 out of the 116 national pathways are also identifying some actions related either to replace, to restoration and sustainable forest management. Um, one, one or two examples uh, on integrated landscape approach uh, in, from, uh, from, from Brazil, we had a very important example from the Para State and the Paragominas uh, municipality that, are, that managed to shift the needle from deforestation to uh, sustainable production by implementing a macro zoning law that legalize, legalize the use of agricultural land and forest for conservation, restoration or intensification according to the sustainability of the land. From Argentina, very important examples of forest management with integrated livestock linked to the results-based payments uh, of REPLAS and, uh, and ANANSA silvopastoral systems. And lastly, a very good example also coming from the modulating of tariffs uh, according to sustainability criteria, where, for example, importers uh, provide information to ensure that the production that they put on the market don't, do not embed deforestation. And Switzerland and Indonesia have a very important, uh, very important uh, connection on this. Closing uh, here, uh, the shifting of the discourse away from agriculture versus uh, forestry towards more balanced and synergetic approach is possible. We have examples uh, and the calls and commitments are there. Now in this era post pandemic, we need to turn really the commitments into actions. And uh, with this, I, I let the mm -hmm. other colleagues uh, and uh, speakers to also put their uh, important contribution. Thanks very much, Veronica. Thank you very much, Serena, for the 
for all these points and how we can shift the narrative and the discourse to move to a more food systems approach. And uh, what I also found very interesting, one of the action areas you highlighted were integrated landscape approaches and among them, the restoration of land. And I think that's a nice bridge to our next speaker, which Ms. Valerie Hickey, who is the director for environment, natural resources and blue economy in the World Bank. And she previously worked as a manager for uh, advisory and operations in the climate change group, where she oversaw the implementation of the bank's commitments on climate change, climate mainstreaming and climate finance. And throughout her career, she has worked in many countries and uh, supported the, a variety of operations, including in fragile states. And she also led the bank's environment portfolio in Haiti following the earthquake in 2010. And, um, this is probably an interesting example, but more generally, Misiki, my question, you've looked into how investing in forests and natural resources can bring back communities and landscape, how it can bring them back to life, or in other words, how to restore them. And what would be interesting to, to see from your experience, how when investing in restoration efforts, what needs to be taken into account so they can support broader development objectives? Misiki, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Veronica, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And I have to say we're meeting this morning at a time when the Brazilian Space Agency just came out with numbers that show that the, they, Brazil, the Brazilian Amazon has hit the highest level of deforestation since at least 2016. There's been more than five times the size of New York City, close to 4,000 square kilometers lost just in this first six months. And I think this highlights the challenge that we all face. But of course, we're also meeting in an event that's, talk that's talking about building back better. But for most of the world, nobody wants to go back because the past hasn't been particularly friendly, not to forests and not to the people who depend on them and who steward them. You know, we all know when we talk about the fact that we're in the middle of a triple environmental crisis, climate change, the loss of biodiversity and enormous deadly pollution everywhere. Just on climate change alone, our numbers suggest that by 2030, which isn't that far away, and it coincides with our the, when we're supposed to achieve the SDGs, if we don't tackle climate change, an additional 130 million people are going to fall into poverty. That's not to mention the 200 million people who are on the move internally because climate change and the impacts it's having, including on forests and smallholder farmers, as Serena talked about, means they can't make a living anymore in the landscapes where they did. And this is all happening at a time when COVID continues to wreak havoc with public health and public finances. Just since 2020, COVID has pushed 100 million people back into poverty. It just speaks to the fact that everything we've done as we prepared this 2030 agenda didn't set the standards strong enough that once people got out of poverty, they could stay out of poverty. With the war in Ukraine, with war and conflict everywhere else, we're seeing debt distress increase in countries. We're seeing inflation up, which is adding to poverty, and we're seeing hunger go up. The FAO report, as Serena just mentioned, talks about 828 million people living without food, food insecure, not sure where they're gonna put food on the table tonight. That's 50 million more people than last year. That's 10 million mothers, 10 million fathers who don't know how to feed their kids tonight. That's not good enough. And that's why working on forests is more important than ever. Because as she was saying, forests are where we integrate development, climate, and nature. This is where we can deliver on all of the SDG agendas, all of the Agenda 2030, not just SDG 15. And that's so important. And as Eval said, it's also never been more important to do this together in partnership. And that's why it's so important, Veronica, that you've brought together all of these different institutions and partners in the public and private sector today. Because as we all know, forest being cut anywhere is leading to sea level rise everywhere. This is a global problem. We can't do it alone. And that's why at the World Bank, as we're really thinking about what a 2030 agenda looks like, we're thinking about how do we ensure we can foment green, resilient, and inclusive development and put forests at the heart of that. And that's because we want a development that sticks, that creates permanent pathways out of poverty for people, 
and a development that restores momentum on the SDG agenda, because we've lost too much momentum these past two years on Agenda 2030. And for us, there's four pillars on which we put on which we put forests at the center of our discussion on green, resilient, and inclusive development. And as we think about these pillars, we make sure that for each one of them, they integrate immediate development dividends. There has to be immediate results that make life better for the people who live in those forests. It also has to deliver on the climate agenda. And we know from the IPCC that 37% of the solution to mitigation of the way we can keep this planet below warming two degrees above where it needs to be is nature-based services. It's through forests and, and of course, helping on the nature agenda. But we have to make sure that we do that in partnership with poor countries and in partnership with poor communities in every country, because we cannot have an agenda on forests that asks the poorest among us to bear the burden of keeping forests standing unless those forests deliver them benefits as well. And that's why our four pillars focus first on creating an enabling environment that does integrate development, climate, and nature. And that's talking about putting forward robust policy and building credible institutions which are important to implement that robust policy and to ensure that standing forests and all of the services they provide are both good for the global agenda but also good for the local agenda. Our second pillar is about doing the actual hard work of protecting forest assets, restoring forests. This is can be everything from gazetting new protected areas to managing existing protected areas better. As we have a discussion around the new global biodiversity framework, we talk about the 30 by 30 agenda. We cannot forget the protected area state that already exists that is poorly managed. We have to improve protected area management, not just build new protected areas. And of course, it's all about doing restoration at a big scale. Our third pillar is, is all about growing and diversifying businesses around forest capital, sustainable businesses. And that's important, whether it's sustainable forest management, whether it's agroforestry, nature-based tourism, these are just three, but this is really, really important. And finally, of course, it's about sharing benefits. It's about the type of Red Plus finance that Serena mentioned. It's making sure that forests deliver, not just for national treasuries, not just for the global agenda, but for the indigenous people and local communities who steward this forest, for the smallholder farmers, who depend on the ecosystem services that flow from forests to increase their income, reduce the uncertainty and reduce their hunger. We And, and this approach works. We've showed it in places like Ethiopia. We're restoring and better managing 900,000 hectares, delivered benefits, more money, more food security for two and a half million people. Those are real numbers. In the Amazon, I started talking about how bad things are in the Amazon right now, but through the Amazon Sustainable Landscapes Program, we work on with the Global Environment Facility, UNDP and WWF in Brazil, Colombia and Peru. Just in 2021 alone, we were able to work on improving management of 43 million hectares of protected areas, restore over 5,000 hectares, and that benefited 28,000 people. And those are 28,000 of the poorest people in Brazil, Colombia and Peru. And so, Veronica, I just wanted to say to you and to everybody else that the World Bank stands ready to apply our money, our technical assistance, our analytics, and our convening services to really unlock the power of forests to help us all achieve Agenda 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for your strong and very passionate call of, you know, of us needing to step up action and to work together and also, you know, to put the, the expertise of the World Bank at the service of, of forests. It's very much appreciated. And also, you know, the insights you gave on very concrete examples, how these practices work and that they can change the life of, of many. Um, and I also find it very interesting you mentioned, you know, the growing and the diversification of business opportunities. And this brings me to my next speaker, who is kindly joining us from Indonesia, Dr. Cristianto. Um, he's the Director of Forest Product Processing and Marketing at the Director General for Sustainable Forest Management at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Indonesia. And he's a senior scientist and he's worked 
on in the areas of forest product technology, focusing on wood, bamboo, and rattan processing technology um, as, as an area of, of research. And Mr. Cristiancho, um, it has not been mentioned that much today, but we know that the annual global consumption of natural resources will be increasing and is expected to double more to more than 290 billion tons in 2060. And forests can play a huge role in providing these new needed renewable resources. And Indonesia is currently holding the G20 presidency and is focusing on recovery from the uh, COVID pandemic. And Indonesia has also made many efforts on a national level to use natural resources more sustainable. And for us, it would be interesting if you could reflect on how we can achieve food and nutrition security, but at the same time manage to protect the forests while using them sustainably and in that sense, you know, supporting the livelihoods of many. With this question, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Good morning, good uh, afternoon and good evening here in Indonesia. My name is Christianto. And yes, uh, first of all, from my point of view, when it comes to land-based sectors such as forestry and agriculture, uh, the main principle that must be upheld is to ensure that every inch of the land is wisely utilized. Indonesia's forest area with an area of more than 120 million hectares, or about 60% of Indonesia's land, certainly has an important and fundamental role, especially in providing land and space for the benefit of national development. One of the main land needs for Indonesia is to meet the food needs for Indonesia's 275 million people. Social forestry is a national priority program to manage forest sustainably, to improve community welfare, including through agroforestry, where communities earn income from forest products and intercropping agriculture and plantation. Of the 4.1 million hectares of social forestry permits that have been issued, an area of 285,530 hectares have been planted with food crops spread across 30 provinces. The Ministry of Environment and Forestry, in collaboration with the state-owned forestry business, Entati, we know it as Perhutani, and the Ministry of Agriculture has initiated the Social Forestry Food Security Program. This program aims to encourage community participation in social forestry programs, and provide assistance for the development of rice and corn commodities, production facilities and equipment, technical assistance in rice and corn cultivation, and post-harvest production. The Social Forestry Food Security Program is carried out using an agroforestry system in forest areas, both on Java Island and outside Java Island. Forest areas in Java are suitable for the cultivation of rice and corn as intermittent crops. The potential area of rice cultivation and secondary food crops in Java Islands cover an area of 196,240 hectares. Of this, so far, 100, 106,212 hectares have been identified, of which 30,400 hectares are suitable for corn cultivation in social forestry areas, and 15,000 hectares and 60,000 hectares are suitable for rice and maize cultivation within the Perhutani management area, respectively. Meanwhile, the potential agroforestry development area for rice cultivation and food crops outside Java Islands includes 46,670 hectares in the com community forest area and 72,950 hectares in the village forest area. Furthermore, the fulfillment of food needs is not only applied through social forestry schemes, but can also be pursued through forest utilization permit schemes or PBPH. After the enactment of the omnibus law, there has been a paradigm shift in forest management. Previously, production forest management was through a timber-based management approach, which later transformed into forest landscape management, like what uh, Serena mentioned. And the current forest utilization permit schemes scheme uses the multi-business forestry approach. Multi-business forestry is defined as the implementation of several businesses by management units in forest management right areas. Forest utilization, business permits, or forest 
areas, environmental services, forest product. So what I mean by forest uh, multi-businesses is forest areas, environmental services, and forest products. Collection of forest products, social forestry, as an effort to optimize the productivity of forest areas, especially production forests. The main keyword of multi-business forestry is optimis optimization of forest area productivity, which means not only optimize optimization to produce timber forest products, but also including for non-timber forest products, but also including, sorry, but also including for non-timber forest product and environmental services, including the provision for food needs through the development of agroforestry programs with communities around forest areas. Multi-business forestry's main principle is how to meet the various national development needs that can be provided from forest areas with condition ecologically sustainable, socially accepted, and econom economically feasible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us this overview on how um, Indonesia is working on reconciling on one hand the food security needs, but also you know providing economic livelihood and sustainability, but you know from the environmental, social, and economic um, sites and you know through a range of products not only you know timber but also rice um, and corn and you know with an you know landscape management approach uh, with this i would like to move to our next speaker to bring in the perspective of you um, gabriella veneros holds a bachelor in forestry engineering from the national agrarian university of peru and she serves as a commissioner for itto at the International Forestry Students Association. Um, Gabriella, at the World Forestry Congress, which took place from 2nd to 5th of May in Korea this year, uh, we also saw the adoption of a youth call to action, which is entitled Work With Us. Um, what actions do you consider necessary to scale up the role and the involvement of youth to bring on board their knowledge and their ambition and maybe their innovative ideas to support the, the global challenges, um, particular of halting deforestation and forest degradation and promoting sustainable forest management. Uh, Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here to talk about the role of youth as an innovation driver to build a future with forests and trees. I believe that the actions to be taken to involve young people in the fight against deforestation and forest degradation should be the following. First, access to quality education. We must ensure that inclusive and equitable access to high quality forestry education and training is warranted for young people everywhere. From the beginning of the pandemic to the present days, many families, especially in developing countries such as Peru, which is where I live and study, have been hard hit by the lack of work, bringing economic problems to household. Many young students have had to drop out of university because it was impossible to pay for it, and instead had to generate income to support the family. This was even harder for students living in remote areas, as they had no access to, to internet and computers to take virtual classes. A big gap has formed between those who have the privilege to, of accessing university and those who do not. Therefore, in order to reduce this gap, we propose the following ideas. First, improve programs that prepare the youth in technical knowledge, but also on socioeconomics and global political economy perspective of the forest sector. And expand the number of scholarships available, particularly in developing countries, and enhance international support for implementing effective and target capacity building programs. The second idea is ensure decent work and career development for your everywhere. Many of the jobs with a decent salary for a decent life, especially in developing countries, require, require at least one of to three years of experience, master degrees, diplomas, and training course. But how can we meet these requirements if there are no job opportunities? Many of us forestry students come out of public uh, universities 
And since we have no work experience, the salary we receive are low, and it's very difficult to get a diploma or even a master's degree. Most of the jobs for students or recent graduates are on a project basis or for a short period of time. There is no possibility to gain sufficient enough work experience and this result in the love of young, young talent because they have no opportunity for development. So they have to work in other areas than their studies in order to earn a decent salary. So how can we fix that? Well, it should be a priority engaged with youth to better understand how the forest sector can be a more appealing career option for youth and create more decent job and career development and advanced opportunity. And also a strange and enhanced multi-sectoral collaboration between governments and the private and academic sector to provide high quality mentorship opportunities to ensure a smooth entry into the workforce for you. Finally, I would like to say that effort should not only be focused on those young people who have been able to access higher education, but also on those who live in the forest. Uh, many young people prefer to give up work in the fields because it's not enough money to survive. They migrate to urban areas to look for a better opportunities. So we are losing manpower and knowledge because what they know about farming, they have learned from their parents and grandparents. This is, that is what, why invest must be decentralized, inclusive and sustainable over the time. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella, and some, some interesting food for thought and maybe something to think as, as, as programs are being set up, how to keep alive the generational knowledge through youth and to really finding a way of creating jobs for youth in the forestry sector. And I think you had a point there of making sure that the sector becomes more appealing, especially as we discuss how it can contribute to solving those um, global challenges. And I think this would be a good moment now. I would like to open the floor um, to the panel discussion. I see we've received some questions already. Um, some are already being written um, and responded to in, in writing. Um, as I'm not sure that all participants can see the question, I would just you know, um, start with the question that uh, Patrick Carlos has put forward. And I see Valerie Hickey has already replied. But maybe you can just quickly um, respond um, here as well, um, because you talked about the four pillars and I think many of our audience would be interested where you're basing these pillars from and maybe to learn more about. Thank you. No, thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Patrick, for the question. So this has come out of us doing an awful lot of thinking around how do we actually integrate development, climate and nature? Because I think we all agree with the narrative and we've all been very good about speaking about this, but we've been looking at projects and really trying to decipher how do you autopsy a successful project that has delivered real benefits for people, that has delivered mitigation or adaptation benefits from a climate perspective, and that has been good for biodiversity. And these four pillars are really what we began to see as the common threads throughout. And we think it's very important. Now for each of these pillars, we think about the policy, the, the institutions, the infrastructure and the finance that are important to make each of the pillars work, including that first pillar where we talk about policy and institutions, but the type of integrated planning that we heard from several people, from Shim, from Ewalds, from, from Serena and others today that is so important. But for each of them, when we, we talk about, for example, growing and diversifying sustainable businesses around forests, it's very important to think about what are the policies that matter there? And this isn't necessarily about forest policy. It's often about business policy. What does it look like? How do you connect with the types of work that with the, the, the types of international policies for importing countries where we're looking at things where people are trying to decouple deforestation from commodities. What does that look like? How do we make sure the policies in countries work? And of course, being a bank, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure there's finance available for each of these pillars? And this is one of the things that lately we, we've really realized that what we need to do is catalyze a chain reaction of finance. Too often in finance, 
we look at it as about financing a project, one project to build a strong forest institution, to create a new protected area, to do sustainable forest management. And yet what we realize is instead of financing green projects, we need to finance green economies because otherwise we continue to suffer from the boom and bust of project finance where you have a project, it works well while the finance is flowing and then the results erode quickly when the finance is gone. And to do that, Veronica, we're really thinking about how do we better connect grant finance, which is so important to support things like policy reform, which countries aren't gonna borrow for, which private capital isn't going to finance. How do we connect that to international public finance? So World Bank finance, for example, which is highly concessional loan money that can be used to build public infrastructure that often doesn't have the revenue profile to attract private capital, but that is necessary to increase the potential reward for private capital that will attract private capital. So how do we connect grant financing to international public financing to ultimately attract private capital and to make sure that domestic public finances, domestic budgets can be better used to make sure that the money that governments have, which is less and less because of how difficult things are at the moment can be used to the best extent. So that's where we tie these four pillars to the importance of finance for each one and within finance to the idea of running a finance marathon to green an economy where you plug in grant finance, you make sure that attracts the bigger loan finance at scale that in itself attracts the private capital that can really deliver the jobs and GDP and deliver the results we need at scale. Thank you very much for, for illustrating that very clearly. And maybe if I may use an image, it's a bit like planting the seed to have a tree come out that has different roots and therefore, you know, it's stable and, uh, you know, it can, um, you know, help help in many ways. And I think the, the idea of, you know, moving to green economies that don't need the initial finance anymore because there's been, a, you know, a, a spilling over effect um, is, is very interesting. And I think that leads me also to the question to, to Serena, because the Red Plus team is also working in the, the area of, of carbon finance a little bit. Maybe you can illustrate on the project that FAO is, is working on um, and you know, focus a bit on the ideas of policy reform and how to link that with finance, because I feel like this idea has been already introduced a bit now by Valerie. Yeah, thank, thank you, Veronica, and I think uh, very, very good to be in the same line of thought with Valerie as well. I think I was thinking a little bit, how do we scale up all of these uh, sort of actions that are needed? And indeed, uh, beyond uh, the commitment and uh, from the political point of view, and both in the short, medium and long term, what is really, really needed is uh, is finance. I think this was one, one of the points also that was coming up from the World Forestry Congress uh, in the specific sessions that we organize also on the Ministerial Forum on uh, Forest Finance and uh, other, other sessions. And it's very much in line with what Valerie was mentioning, this uh, uh, reno re renovated um, call for synergies between public and uh, private uh, funding. And when we say public, also really from national to international. So having this uh, sort of virtuous, virtuous circle of, uh, of finance uh, uh, that can, um, let's say, lead to uh, 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 rearrangements of the, of the investments in the, in the land use, uh, to rearrangements of investments that are, of course, not to detr detriment of the forest, but actually can boost uh, agricultural production in a more sustainable sustainable manner. Um, and uh, indeed, when thinking about international uh, uh, finance, public finance, we do think very much also on the Green Climate Fund, in addition to World Bank that Valerie already elaborated very, very, uh, very well. But of course, we also think about a Green Climate Fund and also the all the carbon finance that are linked to the rewards uh, to those countries that have demonstrated uh, results and su success in the reduction of deforestation. So try to close the circle a little bit on the uh, prepare of the very intense work that the countries have been doing the last 10 plus years of uh, 
preparation of REPLA strategies, for example, identification and connections of their uh, actions to reduce deforestation in the REPLA strategies with NDCs, and therefore also this passage that the countries have done into the, the, the progress with the, the Paris Agreement, so connecting REPLA with NDCs, implementing actions on the ground really to achieve the results and finally achieving their uh, results-based payments through GCF uh, uh, window opportunities uh, that uh, we hope that will be uh, eventually reopened for, for countries to, to be able to access to, to those uh, payments, but also through increasingly emerging market uh, systems and uh, emerging um, standards that are calling for also the connection with the private sector for more uh, and enhanced environmental integrity of the emission reductions and therefore all the discussions or on our trees the discussions on the on the leaf coalition for example and other opportunities of uh, uh, carbon finance that can really link the the, the rewards to to the, to, the, the, to the efforts. Uh, various countries, we have been supporting various countries in achieving results-based payments, uh, especially in Latin America, because they were the pioneering countries in moving progress uh, in, uh, in these results. Um, Chile, Colombia, Argentina, but also in other countries, in other regions such as Africa and Asia, there are a lot of opportunities and the FAO stands ready to support. I would have other points, but for the time being, I'll, I'll stop here, uh, Veronica. Thank you very much, uh, Serena. Also, you know, a very concrete bunch, bunch of ideas of how we can link, you know, the, the governance and with the finance. And it's a very dynamic sector that is, you know, growing in terms of green finance, you know, maybe not, and as, maybe forestry is not yet the area that is, you know, among the biggest in the, in the green finance uh, sector, but definitely you're growing. Um, I wanted to see again with uh, Dr. Cristianto, um, because I'm, I'm curious about the question of agricultural production and also, you know, Serena mentioned it there to, produ uh, to you know, boost agricultural uh, productivity. And maybe you can tell us a bit more about the forest permit schemes and the social forestry schemes that, that you have mentioned, how they work, you know, in terms of, you know, increasing productivity, but making sure, you know, the uh, resources are still being used sustainably and maybe already as a follow-up question with this, and this is already a, a question also to the other panelists, um, what would be needed to, to scale up to uh, those innovative ideas that we already have, you know, and very concrete suggestions to policymakers um, as we're now moving to the HLPF um, later today. Um, Dr. Cristianto, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Veronica. Yes, I'm from the government point of view that uh, we need to include the, the, the uh, uh, people uh, near the forest. The social forestry is one of the form of it. And uh, they can uh, uh, ask for the permission with the government with uh, individually, uh, or they have a cooperation, uh, a, a group of people that uh, they gather together. And also one of the small uh, small medium enterprises, they can ask for the, the the permit to go for the social forestry, and this social forestry uh, uh, is an area with the uh, omnibus law, with the UCK. We uh, try to open. It's not only uh, uh, utilizing the area for the for the forest for the timber, but also for what we call it multi business. So they open for uh, nowadays. Uh, People is going for the uh, uh, natural uh, based uh, tourism. It's not only uh, it's not a big deal when they make an, uh, with the selfie with their phone cell with a good scenery. It's it's good for them to uh, get a good creation uh, in every village because uh, the every place they got uh, their own space. They got uh, the specific uh, scenery. So uh, we, in that uh, particular area, they can uh, develop in this very small scale uh, in the village. And then uh, they put it in the Instagram, they put it in the Facebook. It's, it's uh, going around and uh, it's, it's uh, open the business opportunity for the village that uh, previously they don't have any uh, income. So people come to take the, the specific area, to take the, uh, the, the picture of that area and they put it in Instagram. That's, that's uh, the, the power of the media social. And the other thing is that 
uh, we also think about uh, the the, the non-timber forest product if the in the area is they have a specific area like uh, the specific uh, potential like bamboo or rattan or the other resin or honey they uh, they can uh, pursue from the permit and uh, because of the the new regulation the permit is not complicated so they asking for the permit to the government and uh, the government will uh, will grant it the uh, the the way they, they, they need to do business the, the, the area and to scale up the, the, the point of the social forestry is not only for the people who understand or uh, to the area, but they also uh, helping uh, basically to helping people uh, in the in the near the forest. Because uh, as uh, you may know that the only uh, business in Indonesia that uh, survives during the pandemic is the uh, forest based uh, business. So uh, it's it's good uh, good, uh, good example that uh, they are not connecting uh, they are not uh, have uh, uh, they are far away from the the crowd they uh, they they produce the timber of course and also some of the area they are producing more on the honey they are producing more on the uh, resin they are producing more in the in the bamboo and rattan so basically I'm. Uh, uh, from the government point of view, we try our best to, to achieve the SDGs uh, target by optimizing the land and optimizing the, the uh, we, we also involve the, the people near the forest, but we push it with our, our uh, government as a regulator. So we provide the policy that support them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's been a very good illustration of how the government can support, you know, local initiatives um, by, you know, providing a supportive and um, innovative framework there. And also, as you mentioned, that it's not, you know, the people working and living directly in the forestry, but, you know, also the neighborhood and the adjacent communities that thrive um, from, from the sector. So there was a very good reminder there. And I think that leads me to my next question. It has already been partially responded to in written, um, but it um, leads to the role and the linkages of poverty. And also in the HLPF, the, the title of the session is SDG 15 and interlinkages with other SDGs. Um, so the question from Justine has been that poverty is both a cause and effect of deforestation and forest degradation. Poverty is massive and increasing in much of Africa. What should be done to solve the problem? I see that, that Valerie Hickey has responded, but maybe also Sham wants to, to step in there as well, um, if she wants to you know, elaborate a bit more what the two of you have put in written. I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe Valerie. Thank you, Veronica. I mean, largely, I think it's absolutely critical to remember that forests are one of those solutions that are that can be win-win-win when done properly. And it's important to remember that being done properly doesn't mean simply left standing to manage a global agenda while forgetting that there are national interests and local interests and local institutions that need to have their interests served too. And that's why thinking about integrating development with the climate and biodiversity agendas are so important. Gabon, for example, has been a leader in thinking through how to do this in the Congo Basin, where they're thinking about how do you look across the landscape, recognize that forestry is absolutely critical in terms of the ecosystem services it's providing for the rural poor. And we all have to remember that of the 10% or so of the world's people who live in extreme poverty, most of those people live in rural areas. They're not living in cities. So these are smallholder farmers who are food insecure. These are indigenous peoples and local communities who are living in dire poverty around forests. And so Gabon is thinking about where do we leave forests standing? We're leaving those forests standing can attract red plus payments and other payments. And that money can be used to create social safety nets and create welfare and paths out of poverty for local people. Where else in the forest can sustainable forest management be done? Where you, you can do sustainable harvesting, not just to export round wood, for example, but really to think about how do you do value added processing? 
Where else in the forest can we do nature-based tourism where people want to go see the famous forest elephants of Gabon? And how do we make sure, how does Gabon make sure that its local communities are benefiting from that tourism? And tourism is designed in a way to leave the money locally and not to leak out and leak into other areas. And so that's the kind of integrated planning that has to happen. But the foundation of thinking about how do we use natural capital and forests to deliver on this sort of triple agenda to fight the triple environmental crisis, but deliver on development. It means understanding the value of natural capital, understanding where it is and what it's worth. Because we've seen too often, we've all heard, if we can't measure something, we can't manage it. And too often that means where it's not measured, it's not managed, it's liquidated for the, the pockets of already wealthy people leaving behind even poorer people and more vulnerability. And so understanding, and we're helping every country through a program we have called the Global Program on Sustainability, GPS, formerly known as WAVES, the Wealth Accounting and Valuation of Ecosystem Services, we're helping countries actually account for their natural capital, know where their forests are, what the value of those forests are, and the value that those forests are creating through ecosystem services, so that that, that information can be used as part of a decision-making framework. So completely agree that, that poverty and vulnerability is both a cause and an effect of deforestation, illegal deforestation. And so we need to manage forests in a much more integrated way, but we need to think about, at the end of the day, not just having a conversation that pits the global north against the global south, where we want the Congo Basin to stand because it's important or the Amazon to stand because it's important for global climate change, but rather how do we ensure we will pay for it to stay standing, but allow enough of it to be managed in a way that also delivers jobs and GDP locally. Thank you so much again, you know, for highlighting the value of, of natural capital and that it needs to be better integrated in the decision-making process um, and, uh, you know, how this can also link to efforts um, to addressing, you know, poverty. Uh, Sham, I think you also have responded to this question. Maybe you also want to elaborate here a bit further on your thoughts. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Veronica. And yes, I fully agree with what Valerie has already mentioned here. And I put a comment in the chat to answer that question, to say that the World Bank had issued and published a report in 2021 entitled Designing Fiscal Instruments for Sustainable Forests. ITDO had contributed to a chapter within that report, which looked at the vulnerable economies, particularly, and how to design fiscal instruments that can motivate and incentivize um, respect and acknowledgement for the value that forests can bring, particularly when sustainably managed. My mantra has always been that harvesting from legally and sustainably managed forests is not deforestation because it is extremely key that the communities and countries that rely on forestry revenues as a national source of income need to be incentivized to manage those forests properly and not succumb to the fiscal attractions of other sectors such as agriculture, mining or even infrastructure. Now, it's absolutely true that there needs to be a mechanism that is agreed at the national level where a certain percentage of the forests can be left standing. Why? Because of its multidimensional contributions to international goals. And at the same time, the production forests need to be sustainably managed in order to provide for the three pillars of sustainable development. So that's economic returns and environmental and social protection. This is key. And from an analysis that was done on forests worldwide, from about a decade ago, actually, it was 2013 when I was in my previous capacity, prior to joining the ITTO, it is very clear that forests touch almost all of the sustainable development goals for 2030. This is something that we need to amplify even more at a high level in order to encourage and provide incentives and motivation for countries to follow suit. So some of this has already been advocated at the COP26, and I'm hoping that there will be a, nash, a natural follow through at the COP27 to capitalize further on the true value of forests. Now, it's interesting that Gabon has also been mentioned. I just returned from Gabon yesterday, actually, 
because that was the Congo Basin Partnership on Forests. And it is extremely true that Gabon has been quite, how would I say, um, innovative in coming up with what they are currently pursuing. But it will be very interesting for all of you to know that there have been several other producing countries, for example, my home country of Malaysia and even Indonesia that have actually executed such measures from at least two decades ago. Now, the, the thing that is in my head is, despite all these efforts, how is it that some countries gain traction and some don't in order to attract international public financing? I think it's more a question of, on our part, and advocating further understanding of the value of natural capital has already been work ongoing for at least three decades. So that's 30 years, from 30 years ago. But accepting that value for financing purposes is something that has been slow. Sorry for being so frank. It has been incredibly slow in gaining traction from international large donors to get to that level to see why these values need to be financed and why that financing needs to continue. And I'm not saying that this should be free finance all along. Grant-based financing, of course, is extremely important due to the levels and differences of GNP and GDP between the donor countries and the recipient countries. But grant financing can always be followed through, particularly if projects are successful at the national level, for them to include that in their annual or their five-year or 10-year economic development plans. There has to be a good return, a decent good economic return in order to make those measures viable for the future. I think I'll stop there. I hope my intervention was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think also a question to all of us of how we can support this process of increasing traction, but also, you know, making sure that the return, I mean, in this case, we're speaking of an economic one is there, but you know, also the, the, the people living on the ground in the forest with the forest, how they see a good return and that they see a benefit of, you know, either protecting or using the forest sustainably. Um, I think also Serena wanted to come in briefly on the question um, of poverty and the uh, forestry, how this is interlinked. Okay. Thanks, Veronica. Just very quickly, a bit to echo the very important message of Valerie and Shim, but uh, in, my, in my opinion, it's also very important to stress that uh, all the actions that uh, countries at different level, national, subnational, or very local, do on halting deforestation, restoration, and sustainable forest management are not and should not be done just for the sake of uh, climate change mitigation or for environmental uh, purposes, but these are always been done for sustainable development as well. I mean, the key, sort of the key target of the actions on the, on the ground is all, always, uh, as uh, Valerie was correctly mentioned, kind of a triple or quadruple win <laughs> because it's a, it's a very, um, uh, it's very special asset, what we are talking about, a natural asset that has so many co-benefits climate change mitigation, adaptation, because when we think about the, the forest sector, indeed all the actions that we do to, to mitigate climate, ch climate change also link to adaptation on the, on, of the local communities to promote and to support them in, uh, for example, better uh, resistance or resilience to, to, to climate change and to, this, to disasters. At the same time also, uh, it's very important to think of uh, how these actions enhance the um, the rooting of the countries, of the oh, sorry, the rooting of the communities in the territory, in their territories. Very often, we think we we see, uh, for example, uh, one case comes from Argentina on the need and the uh, and the sort of uh, emergency of migration of communities from the uh, provinces or from the local territories because of lack of. Uh, kind of a livelihood or sustainable uh, source of income. Now, one of the projects that we're doing with them actually through the plus results-based payments is to uh, use part of the distribution, use part of the funding, part of the GCF uh, funding to tackle, to make them trickle down to the provincial level and to enhance investments in the territories and therefore in the local territories and therefore 
for the benefit of the local communities and uh, trying to really uh, enhance also the possibility of communities to thrive in their territories with no need of uh, migrating if they don't want to do to do so. Uh, and also just to echo the, the important message of the integrated land use planning and really try to uh, make best benefits of where the land needs to be or can be used for agriculture, where it can it needs to maintain for pristine uh, forest, uh, etc. So just to echo also this is very important message from uh, variation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. And maybe let me give the floor again to Gabriella because you were mentioning the word territory and thriving. Maybe Gabriella has an interesting experience to share with us from a farmer's field school, um, how you know communities can be brought on, on board. You are muted, Gabriella. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, I want to share an experience that I had uh, last week. I was working with uh, farmers in the Amazon rainforest. We are doing an inventory of forests. And we realized that there are a lot of lands that they could because they need to eat. And they know that it's not a sustainable practice over the time, but they don't have the technical support to change that. So I think one of the main goals we must do is to provide them the technical support and also the capital to maintain the sustainable the agriculture in, in their lands because most of their lands are sold to other people to do mining or something like that and not to protect the forest. So I think it's really important to provide them the knowledge um uh, I don't know how to describe that, the half the, the package of knowledge to, to the farmers. Thank you, Gabriel. I think it was a very important reminder of making sure that moving to action, you know, means also, you know, sharing the knowledge, making sure that those live from the forest can, you know, um protect them and uh, have a benefit from it. But I think that is, I think, a point that has come out very clear um, from, from this discussion that policies and development need to work with and for the people on the ground. Um, and with this word, I would like to thank our panelists and also the audience uh, for the highly stimulating conversation for the questions. I see there's still some com uh, comments coming up in the chats and I see our panelists are still um, responding. But I would like, like now take the moment um, to move uh, to Eva Drummersteiner for his um, concluding reflections and maybe give us also his idea how we can build forward better, differently, more inclusively um, by investing into forest-based um, solution. I've already introduced Eva at the beginning. He's the deputy director of the FAO Forestry Division and he has been coordinating the production of the State of the World's Forest Report. Everett, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valerie. And it is really a pleasure for me to, to start with thanking you all. Uh, thank you, ITTO Sham, for, uh, for leading this today and also for your welcoming remarks and your, your input. And also all of you panelists, I really enjoyed very much listening to you. You have been able to put together a very rich strategic discussion that is that is with us for a long time still because they we have been talking about this in the past but what i see a bit different today is that there's a lot of focus on solutions that wasn't here 10 or 15 years ago and uh, many of you who, are, who, who might uh, have felt this discussion uh, there is a shift towards uh, solutions that we have heard from you both strategically but also concretely uh, in in the many dimensions that uh, that we have covered in these uh, almost one and a half hours comes through fairly uh, strongly is here that, as they say, there will not be a healthy economy on an unhealthy planet. So this, this basis of making sure that we effectively address environmental deterioration, climate change and biodiversity was mentioned, but also the pandemic that we have had and will have in the future if we don't get that environmental deterioration under control. Um, that needs to be integrated at the same time as we have seen now uh, this need to address economic 
recovery, address the fallout of crisis. Uh, inflation has been mentioned, the rising poverty has been mentioned, but you have also, all of you provided some elements of how we can go forward with forests and trees providing solutions. As, as one colleague has said, basically during the, the during the pandemic, when things shut down, one of the few things where people could get uh, additional income was forest and trees. The issue that we have uh, is not only, as was mentioned, how do we get this debate into, into practice? I think many of us, if not all of you as panelists for sure, you're working on these every day through your projects and pushing things forward. But all of us, uh, we do know that we need solutions at scale that are cost effective and that reach more marginalized groups that, and that can be implemented rapidly. The, the case from Indonesia and others were good examples of how this can be done. And I think there are many more. Uh, restoration wasn't too visible today, but certainly there is a lot of restoration activity uh, where it's also about giving jobs and income to, to people in often rural, usually rural areas. What the SDG has in the center and has been uh, underlined a couple of times is this protection, the restoration and the sustainable use of forests and trees. But what is really important is that, uh, and it has been underlined, this, this capacity of forests and trees and forestry, if done properly, to provide a lot of benefits to people and with that, uh, basically help a range of other SDGs, not only to make progress, but with this change in the in perspective of forests and trees actually being a powerful solution rather than just a contribution. And I think that has not yet fully trickled in, given that we that we often really fight with uh, with the deterioration of forests and trees because agriculture seems to do that faster and better, but not sustainably in the long term. We've had recently Stockholm Plus 50, and, and, and there, uh, this issue uh, that was brought up in the 1992, and some of you have uh, sort of harked back decades, uh, this environment and development to go together. So uh, that, this was a good point in time to ask what is different today uh, from 1992. And I think a lot of it is actually, yes, it is the same. A lot of it is also different. There is climate finance, there is the carbon neutrality, there is the circular economy use that wasn't so strong uh, 30 years ago or 50 years ago in this case. And that is something that we are moving into. We will need, the world will need more renewable and more carbon neutral materials. And the private sector, uh, not so visible today, the private sector has a critical role to play here in driving such a transition. And that brings in the loans and the access to funding and the, the access to opportunities to do that in a way that protects and restores at the same time as it's helping scaling up businesses with sustainable materials, with sustainable services uh, to provide income and to use forests and, and, and nature in a, in, a, in a positive way and in a sustainable way. One element that is critical that has come out very often here is if we want to change things, they need to be changed on the ground by the smallholders, by local communities, by indigenous peoples that need to be empowered and to lead and scale up their own ways of developing in the context of sustainability and that they need to derive substantial tangible benefits for doing so. Fact is that currently less than 2% of global fi climate finance is reaching small farmers, indigenous people and local communities. So there is a long way to go between the big numbers of finance and the real realities on the ground. There are just no good transfer mechanisms that we have uh, available to scale up. Red Plus is doing some, others are doing others. The World Bank is very, working strongly in this area, but we need to get better at local communities and smallholders getting access to the potential funding that there is the, uh, there. We've heard and we are very convinced that the young, the youth is wanting and needs to build a future that is better than maybe we, we, we can offer them today. But we have also heard how important education is, how important farmer field schools are, how important it is to get from, uh, from a graduation 
into a job, getting a foothold early to do, to be able to develop the leadership and the innovations that drive us forward. This I think is a topic that needs even more attention than we have had in the last decade, building a new generation of, of leaders in the localities, not only at the global levels, and we are happy to have it here at the, this voice here at the global levels. Many of you have referred to the climate conference on the UN Food Systems Summit. Some of you have uh, referred to the World Forestry Congress that was held recently. And we are here in the context of the collaborative partnership of forests, bringing together 15 international entities around the forest agenda here at the global and regional levels. And I think it is really important, and you have underlined this, we need to build on that. COP27 is coming up. The FAO uh, uh, Committee on Forestry is coming up. There are many of those occasions where we need to drive this agenda forward in order at some point in time to really be able to measure this progress on the SDG 15. And that's why we are here today uh, at the High Level Political Forum, because it, it focuses and it discusses SDG 15 and the way forward on it. Uh, and I hope this has been uh, for you, as much as it has been for me, a really, really interesting discussion, fantastic uh, panelists with fantastic contributions, thoughts, uh, concrete, sharp, and strategically uh, at the right point in time, focused on solutions, how can we make uh, things work in practice. We will need a lot of this energy and a lot of this uh, refreshing thinking and acting uh, to, to achieve what the world community has set up to achieve by 2030, the SDG 15 and a range of others. Forests, forest pathways are a critical element of enabling this in the, in the rural areas. So let's make sure they have their chance, but let's also not forget that forests and trees are critical also for cities, uh, both as a carbon neutral material and for uh, carbon and biodiversity services in cities. And with this, I wish us all a good rest of the day. Thank you once again, panelists, for your excellent contributions. And with this, I hand back over to you, Valerie, for closing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Everett, uh, for, for wrapping up the discussion um, so, so nicely and comprehensively. And, and indeed, to make sure in the discussions also afterwards, all of us, that forests are not only a contribution, but they become a real solution um, for development and that development works with the people and, and for the people. Um, with this, we approach the end of today's event, but not the end of the discussion, as you all know very well. Uh, we hope that today's reflection will feed into the deliberations at the high level political forum. The session will just start right afterwards, as well as FAO's Committee on Forestry that Eva just mentioned and of course the UNF C COP in Egypt uh, later this year. I think we all had a lot of food for thought and uh, points to take away to make sure that we come towards a more integrated approach on, on forestry and to coming more from a food systems perspective. Uh, with this, I thank you very much for joining us today uh, to our audience to asking many questions and I wish you all a very, nice rest uh, to your day. Thank you very much and goodbye.